Greetings, and welcome to Office Hours with Dr. G. I'm your host, Dr. G, and I'm so glad you can keep our appointment. Tonight, I sit down with Nicholas Burston, cousin of nine-year-old murder victim Anthony Carter, Alice Jones, sister of 12-year-old murder victim Clifford Jones, and Dwayne Hendricks, author, filmmaker, and advocate against injustice. 42 years ago marked the start of a two-year reign of terror, July 1979 to May 1981, during which at least 28 children, adolescents, and adults were killed in Atlanta, Georgia. Wayne Bertram Williams became the prime suspect, was subsequently convicted of killing two men in Atlanta, Georgia, was vilified as a serial killer, and given a life sentence. However, while authorities quote unquote believed he was responsible for at least 24 of the 30 Atlanta murders of 1979 to 1981, dubbed the Atlanta child murders and ATL kid, Wayne Williams was never tried for the other murders of mostly children. Although the cases were closed, they have been reopened as of 2019 in hopes that modern technology will allow for a conviction or exoneration. Now, some family members of the victims and others who have thoroughly researched the case are convinced Wayne Williams was not the perpetrator, but instead himself the victim of a massive cover-up that reaches far beyond Atlanta. It's time to hear the whole truth about the Atlanta child murders. I want to welcome all of you to Office Hours with Dr. J. How you doing today? Good evening. Good evening. My music is still playing a little bit. Let that play out. Normally, I don't have I don't have enough music to give all of my introduction, but we're gonna let it play out a little bit, and then we're gonna talk. And plus, my plus my speaker's not on, so I hope you all can hear me. Let me get this fixed right now while we're doing. I didn't know my music was that long. <laughs> All right, welcome. Oh no, now it's gonna play. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, now we're on speaker. Welcome to Office Hours with Dr. G. Of course, Dwayne is a veteran. I think this is your third, maybe fourth appearance because we the first time you were on Office we did Hour two did two week a two two part. So I think this is maybe the fourth fourth your fourth go round. So you are a veteran um, a yes, guest indeed. of Office Hours with Dr. G. I welcome uh, Sister Alice Jones, Brother Nicholas Burston. Um, thank you so much. Um, it, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say from a standpoint of how difficult, even 42 years later, all of this must be for you all. And um, and I know that you are glad to have someone like Dwayne Hendricks, Dwayne Hendricks, who is, you know, dogged about pursuing um, justice and, and righting the wrongs and He's in your. He's on your on your side and in your corner. But I um, understand that there are a lot that are not. There are some that would like to just have this go away, and we've already settled it. It is what it is. But um, the most fascinating thing about this whole case for me is the fact that for all these years, I thought, and I may be the only one, I thought Wayne Williams was convicted of actually mur the murders of the children. Mm -hmm. I had no idea until I met Duane and he shared with me that his conviction had to do with two men, whether or not he did it or not is still in question that, but it had nothing to do with the children. Right. Absolutely. So um, Duane, we'll start with you. Um, how how did you get involved um, in the case? I don't know how how old you are, but I don't know. Right. <laughs> well, I was I was, hey, I was a baby. I was a baby. Was going on. I was six years old. Okay. And, um, well, actually, when it started, I was only four, 
in okay. 1981 when they were walking Wayne, that famous scene where they show Wayne walking out of the courtroom, walking down the stairs and he's handcuffed and they put him in the car. I saw that and I said to my grandma, that man didn't do that. When I grow up, I'm gonna help him get out of jail. I didn't even, I was so young, I didn't even know the difference between jail and prison. But that was kind of, like I told you before, that was kind of like the contract I signed with the universe. And lo and behold, 2013, I'm working on a documentary about uh, my native tribe, the Yamasee Native Americans, and uh, a childhood friend of mine who's been my friend since the first grade calls me and he tells me that Wayne Williams wants somebody to do his documentary. So that's how I initially got involved. And then from there, what ended up happening is I started to doing interviews and I started meeting the family members and so on and so forth. I realized how messed up it really was, not just the fact that um, Wayne was in prison for something he didn't do, but also the fact that like in Lynn's case, there were four eyewitnesses that saw her brother's murder. So, I mean, I mean, they described everything that happened from the time that he was abducted to the time that uh, the 911 call was made. Somebody saw every step of it. You now, know, there was a documentary that I recall seeing on something, and there was a one one victim who there was a known pedophile and a barber shop and something. Would that be your brother? The laundry mat. The laundry mat. Yeah. The laundry mat. Yeah. The laundry mat. Yeah. Okay. I did. I don't know what I was watching that I saw that, but there were a lot of, of people that came forth. I think even if I'm not mistaken, a relative of the perpetrator. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Okay. But yet it it was never well, I don't know where it went. And that the perpetrator <laughs> eventually know. did go to prison for something else, I think. And you know, because yeah. he was he was but he didn't go he didn't go for that. And and I'm pretty sure the authorities had the had the knowledge of of of, of what had, had taken place, but yet they chose to Free steer. Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They let him they let him go. Yeah. So if he was let go and he was a pedophile in the nature of what I remember recall hearing, he would have been a repeat offender. He he would have. Exactly. Been, yeah, he was uh, his his uh, his M.O. was pretty low down and nasty, dirty. He was he was really not a good person at all. Good, good individual. But um, the person you're they, talking about, Dr. G, his name was Jamie Brooks. Mm hmm. And um, he he ended up going to prison for a child sex related crime and ended up yeah. dying in prison of yeah, HIV. Mm -hmm. HIV. Yeah. 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 And um, not only was he a known sex offender, but Lynn's older brother, Emmanuel, did an interview with me. And the interview that I did with her older brother is kind of like the catalyst that made everybody start talking about this again online. Because the interview that I did with her brother, I ended up uh, editing it and putting it on Facebook with commentary from a documentary, probably the documentary you were talking about called Reclamation. Mm -hmm. And in that particular documentary, uh, it's a man named Jeff Proof who was probably the most knowledgeable person from the media on the Atlanta child murders. He actually uh, worked for the LA Times right. and they opened an office in Atlanta <laughs> for the LA Times specifically once this happened, just for him to be on location in Atlanta to be reporting this. And he even authored a book called The List with a former detective from a letter named Chet Detlinger. So when I put that interview out, it got like, I wanna say 60, 70,000 views within maybe a month or so. And when you would go through the comments, it was all these people talking about it. And that was kind of like what gave birth to 
uh, so much interest again mm -hmm. in the Atlanta child murders. And uh, with, um, with her brother doing the interview, the thing about that situation is that her brother was actually there with her other brother when he was abducted that day. Right. And the police mm -hmm. took him to the actual location and told her brother Emmanuel that, yeah, they have all kinds of stuff, weird stuff going on in here. They have drag shows. Mm -hmm. They have this, this, that, and the third. Men be with little boys in here. This was what the police was telling him because they were running up and down Bankhead Highway screaming, looking for the baby brother. Yeah. And um, they even threatened her brother mm -hmm. and said, you going to tell them that you came this way to come up yeah. here to the mm -hmm. store and you didn't walk this way and all of these different things that they was doing. Yeah. They did. Now, who is they, <laughs> if I might <laughs> ask? The police. The police. The police. Policy yeah. enforcers. The ones that are supposed to protect and serve. The protectors, exactly. And they yeah. actually wanted to change your brother's testimony as to what had occurred with his own brother. Right. Um, at that point, did 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 he know, or did you all know what had become of 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 him? That uh, Clifford Clifford, right? Right. Not at that moment. Not at that particular moment. No. Okay. They, now, are you older? Were you older than than him or younger? I'm younger. Okay. All right. I'm so, younger. okay. So they, what was their, what, would, before I go any further, please, please, please. I should have said this at the beginning. Please, plus like, please share. This is something that everyone needs to know. Please hit that share right now before we go any further. Um, you know, subscribe to my channel. Yes. But even if you don't do that, please like like and share like and share okay right now because there should be a lot more of you in this chat listening to this firsthand account this information um this this i i want to say it's it's breaking news because even though it's 42 years in the making you know sometimes it takes a lifetime they say like 40 years is a generation and it, sometimes it takes a lifetime for the truth to be revealed. And I will say that over the last that year or so, with everything that we've been going through, a lot, a lot of things have been revealed about things that have been going on. And these things are not new. And these things may even reach all the way back to the cases that we're discussing. So please right. like and share. And I appreciate um, you doing that. So back to this. Um, so you were, how old were you, um, uh, Alice, if you don't mind? I can call you Alice, right? Yeah, you can call me Alice. All right. I was six. You were six. Yeah. What, is your, what is your recollection of, because of, I'm sure, you know, you, you're, you're in the midst of, you know, a whole bunch of. Yeah. I was in the middle of all of it because my mom would not let me at her sight. So everything that was said, everything that was done, I heard because I could not move course. Mm -hmm. So I just remember when my mom got the phone call saying that they found my brother. It was like, it wasn't even 48 hours. They found him really quick. It was that night. Case because we didn't live here. We were visiting, first right. of all. We were oh, not you, did not, you, did, you didn't live in, a, in, in that area? No, we were visiting my grandmother for a family reunion, actually. Oh, my. Yeah, so we had no idea this was going on in Atlanta or my mom would have never sent us here. <laughs> she still right these days like so upset because it wasn't worldwide. Because if they would have made that statement, we would have never been in Georgia. But we were visiting. So um, I remember like when my mom got the call, we were sitting on the porch and they was like, yeah, we found them. And they told her where they found them at. So my recollection goes all the way back to when they first he first came up missing, so I kind of like remember everything except for the the items that my brother told me about that I was not with him on because you know I wasn't with him all the time. By me being the baby, I was with my mother. <laughs> so yeah, so but my brother told me a lot um, of things that 
you know, he didn't share with a lot of people. He shared a lot with Wayne. He probably told him 100% of everything because of the interviews that they were doing. But yeah, my recollection is pretty clear. Now your brother was how old? 11 going on 12. And your older brother, Emmanuel? He's a year older. They were all a year older. Mm -hmm. So they were they were somewhere in an in an area that you all were visiting and were and and your younger your older well his younger brother yeah was kidnapped but right. he wasn't he was not taken he, Emmanuel was not taken they no were they separated or did they get separated somehow okay so they got so they were walking actually walking to a grocery store to buy some items to bake a birthday cake. And my brother likes to pick up cans. For, it's an older man across the street, you know, has to pick up cans and sell cans back in the days. So as he was walking, he was picking up cans with them. But he always was behind them, trailing behind them. So when they got to the grocery store to actually go in the grocery store to buy the cake, it was an older lady outside um, putting groceries in her car. And he asked my brother, could he stay out and help her put the groceries in the, in the car? So my aunt and my, my aunt was with him too. So my aunt and my oldest brother both went in the store and they realized after all the time came by, they Clifford never came in the store. And that's when you know, all crazy chaos broke loose. They came out looking for him, screaming his name. Nobody seen what happened to him. All they saw was knew that he was putting groceries in his old lady's car. And that's how he came separated from them. Because we didn't know our way around Georgia, so it's not like he was wandering anywhere. We didn't know. We didn't even know people here at that time, but our family. So that's how he was. I say he was abducted and snatched because he just not gonna get the car with nobody. <laughs> He's not gonna go walk away from nobody. We were very close knit. My mom didn't play that, and I'm surprised she even let us let them walk to the store. And that's because they was walking with my auntie, which was maybe two or three years older, but. It was supposed to be a straight shot and back home. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm talking to strangers, that's a no go. We just went, we just didn't do that. You know, so. it, 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 what I what what comes to mind, even though he was you know doing a good deed, yeah, um, he was abducted. Is a lot of times, even today, I will see young women walking yeah. down the streets, cell mm -hmm. phones, talking, yeah, baby behind them. them. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes they're toddlers almost and they don't, I mean, someone could jump out of a, a, a car and swoop them up or just snatch mm -hmm. them into a house because they're not even looking, you know Absolutely. what I mean? They're not even, you know, they, they have this, you know, their, their faces in the cell phone and they're not even holding the hand of their, of their child and so forth. So, you know, but here you, I, you know, this is something, like I said, I wasn't aware of. So he was out, he was, he probably helped the lady, the lady drove off. I, I'm assuming, and we're assuming we don't even know she's part of it. Like I said, we're assuming. Yeah, or or <laughs> you know, who knows? You know, because yeah. it, nobody's necessarily going to know that a child is going to be courteous or bring up brought up in a way that will say, "Oh, I want to help the lady." You yeah. know, so you know what? But did she? Did was she ever located? Did she ever come forth? No, and I guarantee you, he didn't go just willingly. Trust me. <laughs> If somebody grabbed him, they had to really contain him because he, mm -hmm. he's not, he's scary. So that's why I say I knew he wouldn't just, we just, he was the scariest one in, of the brothers, like far as going places and doing things like that. So they really had to really contain him quickly because they was going to have a fight on him. Like he was just, he was solid. Like, so it's not like he's, you know, you're going to just grab a kid and he's not going to do nothing. No, not that one. Mm hmm so your 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 brother Emmanuel, mm -hmm. how does he know all? How does he subsequently find out all of the details? Which details? The ones that I, like for instance, when I saw the documentary, they were talking about the laundromat. They were talking about the things that had occurred. Oh, okay. Well, if you I said, said that, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm saying that you you said he shared a lot with, yeah. with Wayne Williams himself. So, was how was he apprised of what had actually occurred? Did that come from the the police, the policy enforcers? Did they share that, or did, was it word on the street? Because that was just that kind of loose. 
Um, I know the police didn't really share it like that. It had to be like people like Dwayne and um, other activists that were really talking about and everything that happened. Because to me, for, quite frankly, from there on to now, the police really wasn't that involved like they should have been. Mm-hmm. The news probably blowed it up a little more than, you know, the police probably to me. That's just my opinion. Because like I said, it's a bunch of connections that we don't know about that's really going on. And a lot of the stuff is politics. I'm just going to say that. But as um, far as my brother knowing about, you know, 95% of it, because he lived all of it, even with them picking him up, you know, and telling him don't tell anybody, he kept that to himself a long time. He was so they, picked, they, they, they were, they were, up. so the police were picking your brother up and trying to make him recant or change his testimony as to what happened. Right. So they tricked him in the car by saying, hey, we think we know where your brother is. That's how they tricked him in the car, first of all. And he was like, oh, okay, you know, then it was like, take me back to, you know, wherever we trace the caps. And I guess when he said, once he got in the car, he realized, okay, I don't know if this was a good idea, but it was too late because he's already in the police car. So they took him down the street. And I know there's a graveyard on both sides of um, Hollywood Road. Hollywood Road, yeah. So they took him past that down to the, the laundromat. And they was trying to make him say the statements that was not true. And first of all, just to put this on record, the two graveyards on both sides, my brothers were terrified of graveyards. That would have never happened. <laughs> they wouldn't have walked past it, around it, none of it. So that already was alarming when, you know, when he told me, I was like, why would they even do that? But they tried to make him, they tried to make them say their statement. And, you know, he say okay to eat for them to get him back home, of course, because they wasn't going to bring, probably wouldn't have brought him back home if he didn't, you know, agree to it. And of course they needed him, but they thought they was going to have him to say that, to take some of the heat off or to calm down the heat or whatever his, their uh, intentions were that day. But when they brought him back, they didn't bring him back to the house. They brought him back to the street and, you know, of course, told him, you know, you're not going to tell anybody about this interaction that we had. So he didn't tell anybody about that until he was an adult. He kept it all that time. He was that afraid that somebody was going to come back because he said something. But they never came back again to the house to, like, interview him again. So... I don't know what was the purpose of them doing that, but I'm pretty sure they know something that we don't know. I know the purpose. I know you know. <laughs> so, <Tell yeah>. us. <laughs> because uh, the police was involved of and <laughs> they were protecting these known pedophile hotbeds throughout the city. There was a very uh, two very wealthy men involved and one of the men owned properties in almost every area of the city where these children was disappearing from um and this particular man was connected to a white supremacist group uh and he had i want to say probably 75 percent of one of the police force at the time in Atlanta on his payroll. My. So he was basically controlling. And when I say Atlanta, I don't mean the Atlanta police. I mean the Metro Atlanta area, because anybody who's familiar with Atlanta, when you go to Atlanta, you have, you have Atlanta police, but you also have the cab County. You have Sandy Springs. You have Alpharetta. You have all of these different suburbs that are in the Metro Atlanta area. Right. So there were two police departments in the Metro Atlanta area that were heavily saturated with white supremacy. And, um, this is where the, uh, what they call the 8,100 file comes in. I implore anybody to just go Google search Atlanta child murders, 8,100 file and it's going to blow your mind. Mm -hmm. But, but, uh, law enforcement basically were protecting these pedophile rings because they're very high profile people that were connected to them. 
-hmm. wealthy businessmen, politicians, so on and so forth. And now, the, now, this, uh, the one you were talking about, the one that that murdered your brother, um, Alice, now he seems to be a low life sort of a, he was not, he was not, you know, um, I don't think he was wealthy, he wasn't, uh, he was, he was melanated, right? Yeah. He, right. Was, he, was. he was melanated, he, he was not, a, you know, a European. Right. So where did he fit in? Was that just what was that a feeder? You know, it, like sort of a well, I don't want to call. It. Do you know yeah. how we have the they have the Mason and the Masonic orders, and then they have the the right. Black Masons? Was he was, were they sort of a lower level pedo ring kind well, of affiliated? Well, you have uh, anybody that wants to learn more about these pedophile rings and how they work. Um, mm -hmm. Research the Delta Project. Yeah. So just type in um, uh, Delta Project pedophile ring, and it'll come up, and it'll show you all of these places all over the United States where it was these pedophile rings that were operating, mm -hmm. and how children were being abducted and found murdered. Uh, the thing about the what you call the low lowlifes or the melanated people that were involved is that they had to be a conduit for some of these wealthy businessmen mm -hmm. and other people to be able to get to these children a lot of times right you know so that's that's really where it all comes in is that a lot of these people that were involved that were from the community they were low lowlifes that was in mm -hmm. the community that were uh, kind of trusted by some of these kids, right? You know, and that's mm -hmm. basically how they got set up. Like even in the instance with her brother, right? Because it was an elderly woman that asked for his help. That elderly woman could have just been one of the people that was there to help bring children to the actual people who were doing the abducting and so on and so forth. So he didn't just volunteer. She asked if he would. Help, help. Yeah. yes he said, oh, can you help okay. me can you help me put these groceries yeah. in the car yeah ah that 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 takes a different you know puts a yeah. different light on the situation right. it wasn't yeah, like oh, yeah, yeah. So with right. Trump's permission can he help because he asked yeah. you know he just go like okay i'm gonna go he still asked my his older brother, brother right. my, for permission so that's just how, like I said, how we was brought up. It's just not like a, I'm going to talk to anybody type of thing. So, yeah. So she asked for the help. And he was like, okay, can I help you? Can I help her? And they was like, yeah, be quick and come on in the store. Not knowing that nobody was taking people children. You know. Right. So, um, when, you know, and I'm, I want to, you know, have it here from um, you, uh, Brother Nicholas. But let me, let, me say it, something, let me say something real quick, Dr. G, because okay. that's. That's a real important statement that Sis just made because th by the time this happened, her brother was tenth, the tenth murder victim. Well, that's and what I was getting ready to ask. Where had, was, where did he fall in that? You know, right. What, yeah. Right. So had had they known coming to Atlanta it's from exactly, Ohio, had they exactly. known and had been talked about on the news that these things was going on, then they wouldn't have allowed. Exactly, they little brother and nephew to go with this woman because he probably wouldn't even been in Georgia, right? Because <laughs> I know how my mom is, <laughs> right? Wouldn't have never made it to Georgia if that was going on. If we would have, it would have been known, right? Well, you ended up uh, remaining in Georgia, <laughs> well, yeah, because you know they had all the court cases going on, you know, way in the beginning. Now, we went home, we went home right after. Uh, Wayne William was arrested. We end up going back to um, Chattanooga to be closer. Instead of going all the way back to Ohio, my mom went to Chattanooga, which is our hometown, to be closer. So if we have to go back and forth to court, we can go back and forth to court without her, you know. Too much having us unstable as kids going around like that. So, yeah, we end up coming back staying because my brother wanted to find out what happened to my brother. He, you know, he dedicated his life. He dedicated his life.
Sorry. It's okay. Just, just. He dedicated his whole entire life trying to find out what happened to my brother because he kind of felt he blamed it on himself because he was with him, you know. So his whole entire life, he did not have a regular childhood because he was trying to figure out what happened to my brother. So, yeah, we end up being here eventually. Um, I think the year of uh, 1990 is when he was here permanently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your brother, Emmanuel, is he? Yeah, um, lost him three years ago. My condolences, my condolences, my condolences. And um, so you were one of the families, I, I, I would assume, that was looking at, at this, this can't be, this can't be it. You know, you know, you can't lock this man up for these two adults that have nothing to do with my brother, but yet give the world the impression exactly. that that he's the murderer because somebody somebody has gone free. Somebody has, you know, it's bigger than this this one little lone guy with a camera. You yeah. know, this is the, and 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 the the mere fact now I'm hearing that that your brother was pretty much picked up, almost kidnapped himself by the police, the policy enforcers as we call them, and right. and grilled and 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 coerced to change his testimony as to what, or his account, not testimony, but his account as to the events leading up to Clifford's uh, abduction and murder is, is just, it shows their complicit, you know, complicitness, that they were complicit in some way, like you said, um, uh, Dwayne, because I know you have some more information that you've shared with me at, uh, before about things that have been, uh, you know, some of the evidence and so forth, DNA evidence that was found in other states after. Yes. You know, after the fact, but uh, Nicholas, Nicholas, thank welcome you, to the you. show and thank you for um, your patience. Um, your cousin, um, was it Anthony, Anthony, was nine Carter. years, Anthony Carter was nine uh, when he was uh, uh, abducted, I was, and murdered. Now, wh where did he, wh which number was he in the 24 or 30 murders that took place? I, you broke up on me. There you are. I was asking what where where did he fall in that in that number? You know, they were like say twenty-four young uh, you know, children and then and adults, he I was, guess. He was victim number eleven, right after Mr. Jones. Right after oh, Clinton. Anthony, right, oh wow, okay. Anthony, yeah, he was victim number eleven after Mr. Jones and my cousin originally from Hopkinsville, Georgia. He migrated to Atlanta in 1979 to live with his mom. He wasn't even there long before he got abducted and killed. I remember, you know, me and my brother, Kiji, and a couple of friends, we were playing scrap out on July, you know, July 5th, 1980. And, you know, my, my older cousin caught us in the home Sarah Jenkins, we go in, they sat us down and told us your cousin Anthony had been abducted in the Atlanta child murder. And you know, we close with Anthony. Anthony was always smiling, full of energy, just a man of a kid and would help anybody. And you know, we sat and wait, the, you know, because we wasn't sure. They just say he was abducted, nothing certain that he was murdered on the field. And you know, a, a cousin of ours had called and she had confirmed on the sixth they had found his body on Wells Street in Atlanta, laying face down in the grass. And you know, and Anthony had uh, lived in 896 West End in Atlanta, and he disappeared from there. But they try to say he disappeared from 979 Cunningham Street, playing high and go see with a cousin, Jimmy Edwards, Junebug, they called him. 
Junebug is an interesting character to me. And all the files, Junebug is like a suspect. And he was Anthony's first cousin also. I'm kin to Anthony by his father, Larry Burstyn. And Jimmy Edward would be kin to him by his mother, Vera Carter. And they was together. And, you know, Anthony went to live with Miss Carter up in Atlanta. And Miss Carter, on July the 5th, the day before the 4th of July, she had told her son, she said, you know, I'm kind of tired. It's the fifth, about 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm going to lay down. You just stay out front, you know, and take it easy. And don't leave the yard talk. We're going to go to the laundry, lingerie. And like Anthony is, a mild man at key, say, yes, ma'am, you know. So Vera goes in and lay down from about 1.30 to 2.30. And all of a sudden, she jumps up screaming, man, man. That was her day nickname for her. Anthony, between her, we called him Tony, but they love with man, the little thing they had between each other. So Miss Vera jumps up looking for her son and she didn't see him. So she go next door to a friend named Miss Lynn and asked Lynn, have you seen Tony? She said, yeah, for a minute there, he was, you know, helping out my husband boot fix his car. And that was about like 2.30 and so she said he moved on. You know, he scrolled off and played back in the in the in the media right there. And so Miss about two thirty, she said she can't get no results. So she started walking the neighborhood, going up to Harris home, going all around the neighborhood, looking for a kid walking. And she had no no luck. So about four thirty, she come back to the house and called her friend, Brutally Rawson, and asked him, Could you come and take me around and look for my son? And they went around Atlanta looking for a son and no no luck, no luck. So they stayed out there to about 8 o'clock. You know, she was, you know, petrified, you can imagine. And she caught, she ran to go to the police and the police told her, well, Miss, you know, she, she told her, my son is missing, Anthony Carter. She said, well, how long he been missing? You know, you can't say he been gone until 24 hours. And so, you know, didn't get nowhere right then, so she go back home and sit down and you know pondering what she gonna do, you know start calling people. You know she was she wasn't didn't wasn't wealthy at all, actually very poor. Her lights went even on at the time her son got kidnapped, and she sat in her living room. And then the you know one of the cops came out to interview her about her son Anthony, and she was telling that you know he was only nine years old. And he was, you know, just out front, supposed to been waiting for her to get up for they can go to lingerie. And he just disappeared out of nowhere. And, you know, and could y'all please get on and go find it? And, you know, a white officer, he didn't seem enthusiastic about, you know, helping her. So she told him, could you call the uh, the crime unit, the murder unit, and, you know, hook them up before she can talk with them? The task so, force. The task force. And so she calls the task force. And they told, they came right out and said, okay, the next day they came right out. It was only like 72 hours. And they said, well, it's been a couple of days we can start looking for her. And that was on A couple of days for a nine-year-old? It it, it was the sixth before they finally, and he was missing on the fifth. And Mm -hmm. later on that night, they found him. And they came and told her, you know, we found your son. He's in uh, on Well Street, face down with several stab wounds to the chest and to the back. And, and you know, she, and my mom gonna freak out. She tuck off. I want to go to the Grady Mall to see the body, but you know, she wanted to go see the body on Well Street. But the, the cop told her that the body had been moved downtown to Grady, and she got a ride down Grady Hospital there, wanted to see her son, and they rejected her. Wouldn't even let her see her son. And one day went by, two great by. She wound up having to get a court order just to get to see her son and remove him and have him transferred to Woods Funeral Home in Hoganville before we can have the funeral for Anthony. But, you know, in the meantime, to me, Anthony killing wasn't exactly what I felt it, it should have been because. 
they his friend, his cousin, Jimmy Edwards, goes and say they was playing high and go seek. And after they went around the corner and he seen Wayne sitting there selling cotton candy. And once uh once Anthony went around the corner, Wayne disappeared and he got on TV telling the story, making the people believe that Wayne had right. killed Anthony. But come what? to find out with all this, Jimmy was a suspect. The Atlanta right. police had him involved in some, I say, pedophilia or kidnapping at the John Hanley Bars Club right. in Atlanta. Right. And not only that. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. No, go ahead. You go ahead. I'm just going. Yeah, you finished, Nick. You go ahead. Yeah. You know, and not only that, this gentleman beat my cousin the night before he got killed. Hmm. He beat him. This is his first cousin. He hmm. beat his cousin the, front, the night before he got killed. And, make, and fabricated to me the story about Wayne Williams to take the heat off himself. Right. Wow. What's, what's the difference? How in old the, was he? How old right. was he? was the 15 cousin. years old. Right. He wasn't only, this, he didn't only hang around my cousin that got killed. He hung around Timothy Hill, who right. got killed, mm -hmm. JoJo Bell, who got killed. He was wow. friends with all three of these gentlemen that got killed in Harris' home. And they you the said Bill people, is from that area too. They the only people that they were murdered in Harry, Harry's home. The people that hung hmm. around him. And he goes on to say, high and go seek, that it was 40 kids playing high and go seek that night. And night, July 5th, 1980, 40 kids, people getting missing, like kids getting killed out there. 40 kids seen my cousin go around the corner, didn't come back. Only he seen Wayne William. Nobody in the world else seen Wayne William but himself. We can't find nobody in Atlanta, nobody in Harris home that played high and go seek with this gentleman. Right. Nobody, nobody made a statement about anyone playing high and go seek at all. Except him. Yeah, and this Except is what's important for people to know. There was a white suspect that was seen in these neighborhoods that they called the cotton candy man and it's actually old archive footage on that um also he was 16 years old playing hide and go seek with nine-year-old boys with both 16. wow not, right. only that, not only that he gave a statement on 7 30 7 saying that the candy man was cut his uh, cut, cut my cousin Anthony and he seen it. But in 84, Vera Carter gave a statement to Miss Mildred Glover, never mentioning her son playing high and go see. That's four years later. She right. never never said one word about her in her statement about right. her son playing high and go see over at Harris home or uh, 979 Cunningham, whatever you want to call it. That, right. that, that's not true. She never, you don't you think a mother would say, after all she went through, my son was playing with my nephew over in Cunningham. She never right. missed him or Cunningham Street. Right. So, so she was asleep, if I if I remember what you, your account. She was taking a nap, laying down anyway. But she was taking it down. seems like he never even told his well, I don't know what was it her, her cousin or the mother. He never he told, told her that they were playing hide and go seek, and he disappeared. But he said that to the authorities, and he implicated Wayne Williams. Correct, correct. He did that. Was he, he known to to be in the area of where um, this occurred, and and did he sell cotton candy? No, just... no. And no. Um, Wayne, Wayne. He he only said that after Wayne was on TV and became a suspect. Uh, and one thing one thing Nicholas didn't mention is that the police questioned this guy, and he was supposed to take a polygraph text the next day, and he disappeared. The sixteen year old. Yes. Yes, because they asked they they questioned him because 
multiple people reported him as a suspect. Mm -hmm. You see, so he only came back later and made the statement about seeing Wayne Williams in the neighborhood and so on and so forth after Wayne Williams was plastered all over TV. And when he was being questioned, when they backed him into a corner during the questioning, Mm -hmm. and asked him would he do a polygraph test he agreed to do a polygraph test the next day never showed up the next day uh was he ever ever found or did he ever show back up or did he go you know, did after he wayne up? williams was on tv and wayne williams was a suspect exactly he showed exactly. back up. so then they they still why wouldn't they have gone forth with the polygraph though right because they once they, <laughs> once they had a man, they had a man. Exactly. Once they had women, it mattered. Yeah. What see what what people don't know, they know now, but what happened was this with the FBI. The district attorney and and uh Fulton County District Attorney Lewis Slayton is on television on record saying that it was no evidence against Wayne Williams to convict him of a murder. Of any murder. But what happened was this. After the bridge incident, which we found out some very interesting things, one of them being that a cop named Gil Hill, which is probably the most corrupt cop in the history of the Detroit police, was there in Atlanta. Right. Right. But and Gil Hill was the, the guy who was Eddie Murphy's boss in Beverly Hills cop. So he ended up being an actor in everything after all of this. Gil Hill, if you're if you're familiar with the White Boy Rick case, Gil Hill was the uh, detective that was being paid by uh, Johnny Curry, who was one of the biggest drug dealers in the history of Detroit, to cover up murders and everything else. And one of the main hitmen in, that was a part of this group in Detroit is actually on record saying yeah gil hill told us you know don't kill this person but you can kill this one you know so anybody that hasn't heard of gil hill you're not from detroit just go watch the white boy rick documentary but this particular cop was in atlanta and what people need to know about that bridge incident is that it was all staged and it was all fabricated and there's no way wayne williams could have threw a body out threw a body over the side of a bridge. There's no way humanly possible any of that happened. No. But what they did was this. The FBI, the, one of the killers had already sent Wayne Williams' name to the FBI. Right? When the bridge incident happened, they sent Wayne's name to the New York Times. That's how Wayne Williams became the Atlanta monster. So everything that happened was all based on the FBI and, and, and pressure that was taking place all the way up to the White House because George Bush Sr., when he was the vice president, came to a uh, meeting at the governor's mansion in Atlanta and told Lewis Slayton, the Fulton County District Attorney, that if he didn't prosecute Wayne Williams, he was going to get the U.S. Attorney General to prosecute Wayne Williams. And when we put our documentary together, I have a letter from Director Webster of the FBI thanking Lewis Slayton for prosecuting Wayne Williams. Was he the Attorney General in Georgia? He was the Fulton County Attorney General, uh, District Attorney. District Attorney, okay. Yeah. So can you talk about the fact that Wayne Williams may have had some military connections earlier in his life and well he was he, he wasn't military Wayne Wayne's uh father Nick, Wayne's father worked on a few uh military projects because he was a uh educator and he was very good at science and his uncle 
was a colonel for the defense intelligence agency and wayne himself was recruited into the cia junior officers program so that's what that was about but the thing about the cia junior officers program what people need to understand is that that don't mean wayne was jason Bourne or something like he could do something superhuman or something like that that wasn't the case what what was his um with was his father and uncle i think his uncle and father's position did that probably open a door for him to get into that of program course. That, because of i know i notice a lot of of the, the children are of uh military uh high-ranking military uh right. officials, even like that you know the 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 tape i sent you about musical truth right. um a lot of the high-ranking uh military officials offspring end up being sort of mk altered or whatever you called it and 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 groomed correct to be in various and sundry parts of of society because they want they always want to have their their thumb on on what the pulse of what's going on so be it politics right. media music art they're always social like, social engineering social engineering yes right so, so that wayne uh Wayne definitely um, probably was recruited because of his family, but um, if he was some sort of MK Ultra candidate or whatever, he they, he didn't get to go through whatever process it was because he walked away. So he still had the wherewithal to be able to walk away. And I actually, um, one thing that I'll eventually uh, probably release is I still have the original audios from when I first met Wayne Williams and he told me the story about all of that and what happened when he went to Africa and what made him walk away from the CIA junior officers program. You know. So it's kind of like I think if you if you're in and you get out, then they kind of have a vendetta against you or okay. Yeah, yeah. they know who you are. And if they ever need to, you know, pin something on you, you know, they got your number. They know. You yeah. Know. So. Yeah. And that what people need to understand about a lot of this stuff is because how the media, the media is controlled and how corrupt the FBI is. They pretty much will fabricate anything and just make it a reality to people in the media. You know. And you see Lynn is shaking her head because they've done so many things to her family throughout the years. And now imagine their pain because from the offset, they knew what happened to their brother. And it is so bad that a law enforcement official sued the city of Atlanta, a man named Sidney Dorsey, who is sitting in prison right now for a murder that I, I don't think he committed. I don't think he had nothing to do with it, but I, I sincerely think that he was innocent and he got framed for murder because of what he knew about these cases, you know, but Sidney Dorsey right now to this day is sitting in prison. He sued the city of Atlanta and won based on how they handled him in the case because he took information to a grand jury that would have exonerated Wayne and brought more suspects to light. You know, and they told him, stand down, we don't want to hear it. You know, and then because of his, um, I guess his rebelliousness, in that particular situation and him trying to figure out how he could get the necessary information to the right people they put him on like a uh, parking duty or something crazy like that and he was one of the most decorated uh homicide detectives for apd at the time you know but they demoted him and and that's why he sued the city of atlanta because of Wow. And so, yeah, a lot of times, you know, people think that that everyone is in on what's going on. And normally there's a hierarchy of, of you know, the clandestine activities and then the lower level, you know, uh, 
officers or whatever, you know, policy enforcers are, are just doing what they're told to do. So when one right. like this one finds out, oh, well, there's inconsistencies and there's this, oh, I found out this. And it seems like a lot of the information, and I don't know what it was in the other cases, because, you know, we're talking like about 30 victims, you know, I don't know what, you know, what it is, but it seems to me that it's, you know, how you used to say Ray Charles could see <laughs> that there was something else, you know, going on other than this. And like I said, at the beginning of my intro, I did not know until I, you know, met you that Wayne Williams was not convicted of, of murdering any of the children that, you know, he's been tagged as the, the Atlanta child murderer or child killer or whatever they call him or the monster. Right. So, you know, here we had, again, like you said, social engineering and um, put out there. And this is you know, going on to this day. We believe the narrative. And so once you believe the narrative, when somebody comes along like yourself, you know, if, you, if, it was, if it were just you alone, then they might say, oh, see, he's he's off on one of those conspiracy theory, theory tangents. But we have, you know, the two of you who are family members, who are witnesses to what was going on, eyewitnesses to what was going on, and very, very close enough to get the, you know, the inside scoop of what was going on, just like you shared, you know, Brother Nichols is about, you know, the, the cousin and all this stuff, you know, who would who would have known? We never, we would have never known. And, you know, hopefully those who are listening will will take this story um, and, and, and share it and share this video. Right. I'm probably going to have to download it and <laughs> make it and do, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it because right. I don't know what's going to happen because this really blows the lid off of, of, of a, a, right. a so, case that was so big. And, and, and you have a man who for at this point, what, 42 years of his life has right. been, you know, so he was, he's one of the victims. You know, right. these children are definitely and, and young men and you know, and I think it was one young lady, if I'm not mistaken, right? Which no, it was uh a couple it was um yeah, it was twelve year old Angel Lanier and then it was uh what seven year old Latanya Wilson. So it was two okay. Yeah, well, two girls large, largely feet males, but you know, um you know, so, but their seat. So this is this is important you know, for people to understand. And so, you know, like, that's my brother, that's my sister. And to some of the mothers, I'm their baby, right? So it, it, it ain't just them. It's just that they're, you know, they're a part of the podcast that we do. So, you know, even more so when people see this, please go and check out our podcast at Kid Unleashed. Um, but, uh, with the prosecution of Wayne Williams and the two adults that they accuse Wayne of murdering, Nathaniel Cater, the, the second little girl, Latanya Wilson and Nathaniel Cater were next door neighbors. And he was a maintenance man in her apartment complex. And the window that she was taken out of, his fingerprint was found in that window seal. And his fingerprint was actually found at another one of the crime scenes. So there were there were uh, 28 sets of fingerprints that were found in all of the Atlanta child murders. And Wayne Williams' fingerprints was never at any of the crime scenes. But you have one of the victims quote unquote victims that Wayne supposedly murdered and his fingerprints was at two of the crime scenes. And if anybody the neighbor of the of the child that was murdered. Right. Who gave him gave him opportunity. He was a maintenance man and you know and probably motive because he's probably another pedophile. Right. But but not just that. Um uh if you look at the Atlanta child murders and you look towards the end of the list, you'll start to see the ages going up. So it's, it's, it's little boys and girls all the way up until maybe like the last eight or nine. And then you start seeing 17 year old boy, 16 year old boy, uh, 21 year old man, 27 year old man, 28 year old man, 22 year old man. You understand? So it's important for people to understand that part because that was the cleanup. Because most of these people that were adults 
were people that could be implicated as parts of the pedophile ring and nathaniel cater the guy who they said wayne threw over the, the bridge. uh bridge it's a couple things about him for one i have a uh statement of an eyewitness that said they saw him after the alleged bridge incident for one and then the other thing is um he was staying at a hotel called a falcon hotel and two men that i've been able to put two and two together as to who these two men were that were involved in the murders came to visit him and he was never seen again and he told people once certain people started dying he said they coming to get me next wow so you know. I mean, that's interesting so the older victims may actually have been perpetrators that they were now bumping off because right. was, you know you never know if they're gonna crack and start you know right being right. supportive of their people and saying look this was going right. on it's a, it's a it's a conspiracy at the highest levels and so forth and so on so um right um with uh with the uh some of the interviews and things that i've done um one of the people in particular that we know was involved with the murders uh i got a person saying that they saw um 22 year old eddie duncan um leave a part of town in atlanta called techwood which was one of the housing projects they left together and a day later they was pulling eddie eddie duncan out of the chattahoochee river so who did he leave with i can't say the person's name okay. the, person, okay. the person is still living okay but that person right now is in a georgia penitentiary for a child sex related crime and this same person has been accused of murdering another little boy in another state but many of the people that lived through this were protected by law enforcement one of the people in particular um was a man named larry marshall and larry marshall uh admitted that he was involved and he he basically you know told them that this person y'all got on the news wayne williams i never seen him before but i know where the man is who's doing the murders i'll take i'll take you to him you know and the man that was doing the murders was working out of well one of the men that was doing the murders was working out of a coin shop downtown next to the omni which the omni was one of the pedophile hotbeds as well and the interesting thing about nicholas is his cousin he'll tell you that when he was found he was found next to a bunch of coins wow he also was found with uh fried chicken in his stomach and um one of the children in the oakland county child murders which was murders that took place outside of detroit michigan detroit michigan the same place where this crooked cop gill hill was and it was similar to the atlanta child murders it just wasn't as many children but a kid named timothy king was abducted and found murdered there and he had chicken in his stomach because his father said on the news my son's a good kid he'll listen to you feed him chicken that's his favorite meal so that was the last meal they fed him before they killed him was chicken so he was found with chicken in his stomach right and he was last seen wearing a hockey jersey and one of the murder victims in atlanta alfred evans was found with a hockey jersey on that wasn't his the what? same the same thing about the dog hairs and the carpet fibers were right. on these children in oakland county michigan as well as some teenage girls that were killed in dc in what was called a freeway phantom murders and and basically these murders were all linked and the murderers that were doing these murders were 
taunting law enforcement and leaving clues. So even in the case, for instance, with Clifford, Lynn's brother, he was strangled, but he had a mark on his head that was post-mortem. Yeah, because the, the guy, Jamie Brooks, that did this, he was a, he was practicing in satanic rituals and things of that nature. And some of the people that were involved in this, we now know had a cult affiliations and were involved in sort of like a uh, satanic order wow so it's um, just it's just like if you if anybody has seen the son of sam documentary that just came out on netflix is very similar so were these you think these people were programmed or were they just you know willing to sell their souls so to speak to to get you know, have access to children and make and know that they weren't going to be um, prosecuted as long as they were, you know, filling the pipeline for these maybe upper echelon POs people. I'm not going to, I have to stop, we have to stop using the word so much because the algorithms, but the P's, yeah, yeah. we'll call them the P's. So right. they had to feed, you know, they were the pipeline up mm -hmm. to the upper echelon. And so they had the opportunity to if you will, uh, feed their own fantasies in the in the process. Well, I think I think a lot of these people were getting paid very well to do what they were doing. And and when I say the people that were involved in this were very very wealthy people, I mean they were very very wealthy people. Um, for instance, if you if you do the research on what I'm talking about with the son of Sam. There were implications that there were actually some of these murders that were videotaped. So, you know, they call them snuff films and no. snuff films. They they could go for six figures because there are people who are just so sadistic and demented and into these sort of things. And one of the things that is a very uh, little known fact in the Atlanta child murders that there were actually uh filming tape the memorex filming tape when they used to have the reel to reels there was actually some of some of that tape at two of the crime scenes yeah yeah so it's it's i was going to ask you what would have been the motive and now now that that is a motive that if they there it's it's the the fantasy of the the perpetrators and all of the ones that they know millions or thousands and thousands that will that will pay handsomely to see um this um because the, these children i don't know you know in some cases out in la and different places i've heard situations where they would have these drive-bys and by the time they would try to go and pick up their sons they wanted to get their bodies and whatever you know organs have been taken and you know right. different things were not right, right. and and did, was any of that ever the case yes. in these yes yes and um i mean if you know for anybody that's watching if they go watch uh at kid unleashed um my colleague jocelyn jensen she's actually in the um comments what's up jocelyn what's up azar the, the, those are two our people but um her and venus taylor have a conversation on the third episode of our podcast in which venus taylor is talking about hypodermic needle marks that were in the genital areas of the little boys and you can go ahead and tell them what you found out lane if you want to later on yeah i was just agreeing with what you said because i had a co-worker that knew nothing about what i my life um, mentioned that he was worked in the morgue, and he wanted he was wondering why the, all the boys had needle pricks and um and they scrolled them and why they were drained. So I know that to be true, just from right. someone that was there working there. Right, and that's what Venus Taylor told me from day one in 2013 about the hypodermic needle marks in the penises of the little boys. Um, Dick Gregory has gone on record to say that they were uh, extracting interferon from the little boys and um, interferon is used in cancer treatment now in mm -hmm. 2021. Um, 
you know, then there's also that A word, we can't say it, that we now hear that's been made very, you know, popular in the last year or so. You've been right. hearing about that that thing that comes when you you know extracted by fear. Right. And um, um so that yeah. yeah, so you know, it who's to say that it wasn't being done, you know, back then. You know, we, we right. just we're just coming to an awareness of yeah. all of the things that many things that are so go so far back, you know. Well, that, the, the interesting thing about that is that uh, one of the things that Venus told me about interferon and what she was told by a scientist is that the purest interferon are young melanated males of a certain age they have the highest concentration of it in that um when a person dies it ramps up in the body at death post-mortem 500 percent this particular protein in the body and uh not only does it ramp up that much but specifically after a person has been asphyxiated so that's why so many of the children when you look at the cause of death is or i ain't gonna say that's why that's why it could be <laughs> because it's still a theory to so many people uh asphyxiation though increases the uh, uh percentages of the interferon in the body so that could be a reason why so many of them were asphyxiated so all interferon because i've heard about interferon treatments for quite a, quite a while for cancer it's all has to that all of it has to come from human from a human being or does it or or I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I just know I haven't, you know, I, I haven't done extensive research on the interferon. I just know what Venus Taylor told me from the offset, you know, and she's been adamant about that. That's why I'm just telling everybody to go listen to episode three of that kid unleashed because she Venus Taylor don't put no cut on it. You know, she just, Tell it how it is. You're going to learn some things about Maynard Jackson being the mayor. You're going to learn some things about Keisha Lance Bottoms, who was the current mayor, who really opened the cases so that people like myself cannot have access to the files. That's what it's really all about. So they, they're complicit and still trying to keep this. Absolutely. Under. Absolutely. Because they, they tested the DNA, you know. And they've admitted that they've lost so much evidence according to what they say, right? Uh, the lady who was the chief of police at the time, Erica Shields, went on TV and said, the city of Atlanta handled this investigation wrong from the very beginning and they need to own it and take responsibility of it. She ended up getting booted out of town and now she's the chief of police in Louisville, Kentucky. You know. Well, at least um, he's still still breathing. <laughs> yeah, I talk to people. I talk to people behind the scenes who, like people, people send me all sorts of stuff. Now, um, today I got a surprise. Um, I'm gonna see if I can pull it up real quick because people now that know that there's no compromise in me and that. I'm going to keep fighting no matter what. And they've seen all of the different projects that I was supposed to be a part of and I never got to be a part of and everything else that they just send me anything that they think may be helpful. You know, so um, I'm going to share something with y'all. Is this a screen or video file? Yeah, it's going to be a screen. It's going to be a screen, but um. This blew my mind when the person sent it to me because when they talk about um, Wayne Williams and they say the things that they say, uh, I actually have a song that he wrote and I have a contract. So, you know, 
I'm, I'm showing this to show that a lot of the things that I say, you know, I I can back up some of the things that I say, but not just uh, saying it to say it. Let okay. me know when you can see this, Dr. All right. G. All right, let me, let me see. Uh, I got it here. Let me see if I can get it up here. Share. Window. Okay. I'm not trying to. Let you can't see it. it? I see it, but I'm trying to bring it up. Let me see. Okay. Let me, here we go. Let me. Yeah, but that's actually, if you see it says Metro Productions on it, it has a PO box, Atlanta, Georgia address with an Atlanta phone number on it. That's actually a contract that Wayne Williams had with two of the kids that he was uh, getting ready to manage and produce. Were these were these children of uh, subsequent victims? No, no. This is just to show oh, yeah. that. You know, okay. he, he really was involved in doing the things that he say he was involved in. Okay. You know, this is this is a song that he wrote right here. Uh-huh. You see this th these are actually the song lyrics. You see the word chorus there. Right. Yeah. You've been yeah. the sunshine in my life. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't know how the song sounded. I actually heard some of the music and it was pretty good. And then this is because they have accused his father of so many things that you know uh uh are untrue this is actually a uh invoice for the event that uh sammy davis jr was at and frank sinatra and all those people was at where he was uh contracted to take pictures oh you wayne know. williams was wayne williams's father if you see oh. right here on the screen it says sammy davis jr and frank sinatra benefit show for missing atlanta children atlantic civic center so his father was contracted to take pictures of a benefit for the children that his son was being accused of murder That's it was he... after after his son was accused after the fact was it after this yes it was after that way after that yeah so his yeah. he both, both he, the plot thickens, so both Wayne Williams and his father were photographers. His father was a photographer, and Wayne, he taught Wayne how to use a camera when Wayne was like six years old. What people don't know about Wayne Williams is that if Wayne Williams didn't go to prison, he would have been L.A. Reed. Oh, wow. Because he was already... When they say he was a failed producer, he was 22 years old. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? He was 22. Oh, he so was just it, at the beginning of his life. So exactly, yeah. exactly. And he was already established. At 22 years old, he was already working in studios. He was already, he, he owned a radio station at 15. He was in Jet Magazine at Thing. so yeah it now it's like so okay so it, it's starting to all the pieces are now starting to all fall into place with regard to him that he's been on their radar for a very very long time he he's someone who they knew about for various and sundry reasons knew he had potential but if if he, because he decided seems like not to go along with the you know the junior you know alphabet camp that right. he was in that he was you know he was targeted he had a, he had a he had a you know a bullseye on him like you know i'm gonna get you sucker you know you could have been in here and you could have stayed and you could have played and we could have you you know because you know the thing that i would i've learned is that you either get born into it or you get picked for it because they feel like you have potential and, and you we have some folks in in the music world who not bloodline but they 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 sold their souls in order to right. move up the and then they sell the lives of others in order to continually to go up you know in this in this uh a game and in this arena so but i, I did not know it. that about him i know about it firsthand because i was being recruited when i was in the military 
when you when you're in the military for people who don't know when you're in the military you walk around with your last name on your uniform so everybody saw my last name Hendricks, everywhere i went in the military so literally people will walk up to me and be like no way man are you related to jimmy and then when they found out i was related to jimmy Hendricks and i was a hendrix and I was doing all of these incredible things on the base because like I was one of the most popular young people in the the the, the on the base military personnel on the base they started recruiting me to be a freemason you you name it they was trying to get me to do it they was trying to get me to go back and be an officer they was trying to get me to do all sorts of stuff and for the people who think I'm just a conspiracy theorist and I just be running my mouth I had a top secret SSBI, which is a single scope background investigation when I entered the military. So from the time I went into the military, I had a top secret clearance. My uh, my AFSC, which is Air Force Specialty Code, was computer communications. So I work I worked in what's called SCIFS, which is a top secret communication facility. So um I have a very, very, very broad scope of awareness about what the government is capable of, you know. So when people say, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist and everything, you have no clue or no idea how much I know and how much I don't even talk about, you know. But uh, with the recruiting and everything else, they was trying to pull me into all of that weirdo stuff from the time I was like 18, 19 years old. You know, yeah. So yeah. Now I know how it is because I was in there too, and I was I had a secret top secret. I was well, I was in your the army counterpart, and I cart I was in t- intelligence. So okay. I was a ninety eight yeah C ten ninety eight C ten Charlie okay. electronic warfare signal intelligence analyst. Right. So okay. you know, so I'm I went I went to Goodfellow Air Force Base though for you know advanced infantry okay. training. So, so I kind of yeah. I so know. my my units was heck HQ US SOCOM, which is United States Special Operations Command, and US CENTCOM. So the first job I had in the military, I worked for the Six Com Squadron, but it was in support of Headquarters US SOCOM. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and Special Operations is it means exactly that. You know, all of the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets and all of them, they're part of Special Operations Command. That's the command that they fall under. And it's hard, you know what I mean? Um, and I didn't I didn't stay in as long as some others, you know, have stayed in. And the the irony is that um I was a mother when I went in, so I gave my my mother had temporary custody of my the two sons that were born at, already you know born at that time, and she became ill, and I needed to get I mean very ill, and I needed to get home, and our the current POTUS was then you know a junior I was twenty four so we talked of forty two years ago, was the one that put a congressional out on the base at the behest of a. A, a mutual friend that has now, you know, has now transitioned, and that's how I got home. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, although I don't support that, you know, because that was 42 years ago. But the interesting thing is, I wonder, you know, what you know, they psychologists will call you in. I look back now, you know, when they told me I was a pressure cooker, and all that. See, they start to look at people and, and they, they right. analyze what can we use this individual exactly, for? exactly. You know, Absolutely. but I was yeah, but I was able to to get away from that. But so many people get get caught up in that, and then you know, you have no control over who you are, what gets stuck into your body when they say you gotta take XYZ That's right. thing. That's right. You don't know if you are, you know, an experiment in the work. That's right. And oftentimes you are and so forth. And so I was so grateful that, you know, I didn't get to stay in long enough to be a, a you know, a con- guinea, pig. Continual <laughs> guinea pig. Yeah. But people come out of here, of there, and they're different. They're, they're totally yeah. different. They're not. So I don't even know if some of these older suspects had spent time in the military. One of them, one of them definitely. 
was. One of them definitely was. He was a former Marine and he was a black belt. And um, this, are we he, talking victim now? No, uh, oh. suspects. Suspect, okay. And he was in the martial arts and boxing. Nicholas will tell you that the Boys and Girls Club that many of these kids went to, they had a boxing program there. And we've been able to determine that another person that's a very strong suspect actually was so deep in the boxing that he had a brother that was a professional boxer. Another person that was there was a boxer. Nathaniel Cater, the last uh, murder victim, the person who they say Wayne threw over the bridge, he was in the martial arts. Um, Alfred Evans, one of the murder victims, he was last seen going to a Kung Fu movie. And he was supposed to be going to a Kung Fu movie with someone older. Uh, Yusuf Bell and Timothy Hill, who both went to the same boys and girls club, was actually in the boxing as well. Were they starting to put together the fact that all of the, a lot of, not all, but a lot of these children, like you said, frequented the same, you know, establishment? The they knew that. Boxing? They knew that. But they kept it away from from the pub from pub from the public because if you give enough clues and facts out there, you know, we can come to our own conclusion as to what well you, know, you need to go look at the boys club, you know boys and girls club, right. but somebody there is is definitely involved. But if, you, right. if this information is being withheld, then obviously, like you said, there's the duplicity and complicity and so forth at the at the highest ranks. And again, going back to you know, to Alice with your brother. You know, Emmanuel went through was straight out. You know, you see out of one of those movies that we see where they, you know, policy forces grab you up, and, and yeah. by the time they finish with you, you you don't you didn't see nothing. You you yeah. don't you, you don't know nothing. And you yeah. said, yeah. you know, he, he yeah. didn't even tell until he was an adult. Yeah, he kept that yeah. in, and then he blamed himself partially. Yeah, you know, and he wanted to find right. out. You know, and I and I know in in his honor. You know, I, I feel like what you all are doing and continuing to do, you know, is, is so important. It's so important because, you know, we, we I always look at it. We we don't die. Really, we transition. And 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 even though we're not here and not able to see them, I'm so happy that they can see us. You know what I mean? And see what we're doing and also help more from the other side. I'm sure that all of these victims, you know the energy, their energy is going towards this thing coming to to a head and the truth being revealed and, and the and the blame being placed exactly where it needs to be placed and taken off of those who have been wrongly and falsely accused right. and to bring closure to these families. To these right. families. So, and so so you know um that's why I operate without any fear right and even so much so to the point to where when what happened to me earlier this year when the charges was brought against me and everything else and i told you i couldn't talk about it uh jocelyn and i was on facetime together and i told her well i'm going to jail because it's nothing that they could do that's gonna make me tell that woman right there that i'm walking away from this her mama called me baby every time she see me. She she been calling me brother every time. So how I'm a how I'm gonna let her down? Me and him done fought like real brothers. <laughs> bro, you don't know me like that, bro. Like that's how me and him then then got into it, you know, over this and all of the people that have come come in and tried to come between us. They they'll come to him and try to discredit me or whatever the case may be. And it's came from all sorts of different angles. We've been served with cease and desist letters. It's all sorts of things that's been done because the one thing that people have not heard is the truth about any of this. Right. You see, and the the truth in all of this, it ain't about this. Is what people got to understand, it's not about Wayne Williams anymore. They let people out of prison all the time. It's about everything they did 
to put him in prison and everything they've done since to suppress the truth and keep covering up what really was going on. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't seem to get. And that's what people don't seem to understand. Like the disdain that people have for Wayne Williams. When I see some of the comments online and everything else, it's like they so fixated on that that they don't even realize all of the other stuff that they really need to see, mm -hmm. you know? And what they really should see is that they still ain't told the world who killed this woman, bro. And they know who killed this woman, bro. So, okay, if y'all gonna keep Wayne Williams in prison and y'all gonna keep lying about that, at least tell the truth about who did the, the, the murders that y'all know was done. Why they won't do that? Because they know if they admit to the world that somebody else killed her brother, what that does is it's, 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 it's a chain of events that's going to take place after that. And the more the truth come out, the more and more people who know what really happened going to start talking. And that's what they don't want to happen because of the corruption involved. Are there other family members of uh, victims that are involved in, in or working with you all, or are you just are you yes. the other There are others. Yes. Uh huh. So, uh, so you know, and they would never let you know the public know, the world know that the family members don't feel that you know justice has been served. Right. Right. They so they, what, they, they they never yeah. air those interviews. <laughs> they never. Yeah. Right. So did just this past year. They had a, a mural that they uh, put up in the Atlanta, Hartsville, Atlanta airport. And she went and interviewed with a woman and she told the woman, I'm not satisfied. And this is just a ploy for the city of Atlanta to try to do something to feel good. But we don't care nothing about this. Right. They didn't put her interview on there, but they put the interview with the man who lied on Wayne saying that Wayne was a kind candy man, they put him on the news. Oh, he's still around. Yeah. 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 And he's still telling the same lie. <laughs> what what he prison? He lived on the street. Yeah. Oh, he's not even in prison. Not at all. No, uh, -uh. uh, -uh. And he and he likely was the, the, the murderer of his own cousin. Yeah, he was yes, yep. he killed his own cousin. Anthony Carter. Yeah, we think he so. Knows. If he didn't do it, he was right there when it happened. And he he's still around, and he's around children and all of this stuff. He, yep. He, now nah, he's a preacher now, see. That's oh, my goodness. He preaches <laughs> to the people. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I just say, you know, I'm a, I'm a former pastor, but, oh, you know, oh, no. But you ain't one like of, One of the... One of the oh, biggest yeah, people, <laughs> one of the biggest people involved in it, one of the biggest people involved in it was a pastor. Oh, really? And he actually, the, the same man that I'm telling you about earlier, Larry Marshall, who admitted that he was involved and he knew where the killer was and all that. The pastor gave a, a note to Timothy Hill, one of the kids that got killed and told this guy, Larry Marshall, you need to get out of town because they coming to kill you next. And Larry Marshall was found in Connecticut. He fled Atlanta and, and went to Connecticut. And they picked him up in Connecticut on a warrant because he actually was trying to get a job in Connecticut with a fake ID. So when he came back to Atlanta, hey, Mama Eunice, that's, that's Miss Eunice Jones. That's Clifford's mom right there. And Lynn's mom. Hey, mama. Hey, mama. Hey, Miss Jones. Great to Hello. see you. How are you? I'm making it. Oh, uh, well, we are trying our best. We're gonna get the story out and, and, and we want justice to be served just like you do. And and um we pray in your strength and, and continued strength, and we believe that justice is gonna be served. Justice is gonna be served, and the truth is gonna be told. I appreciate that. May God be with y'all. Yes, and you too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Yeah, it's it's right. just you know it, you know I can I can imagine imagine you know just you know you know the the pain and and I I lost a child to crib death, but mm -hmm. which was sudden. But to 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 have what happened, you know, you know, death is death. But to have what happened and then have people just flat out cover it up and make it so insignificant that they could, you know, spin a, a, their own story and and then say, here, take this. And be satisfied. That's yeah. not happening in 2021. Yeah. Um, if, if 2020 was the time of of what 2020 vision, and 2021 is we gonna revision and come back and 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 get the truth out and get the you know. If I nothing know else, I'm too told. What did you say, Mother? God knows I needed to be told. Better give me strength. Yes, he's knowing, yes. He's knowing that you all are doing what you're doing. They're letting me know somebody here. I mean, somebody care. We care. We care. And and they're giving you, they're saying, I'm sorry, got love and blessings and light to you, Queen Mother. They're, they're, they're giving you love in the chat room. And we send you, we send you love and light and, and, and peace and continued strength. And just know that you're not alone. And we want as, as the more this goes out, the more love and light is going to be sent to you. When other people, when they see the replay love and light is going to you and i want you to i know you're going to feel this and strengthen you and we're going to get to the bottom of this i mean we already know the truth but the truth has got to meet with justice right and when justice is served you know then we can be at peace yes they're giving you all kinds of love in the chat room they're giving you love in the chat um, thank, you love. You too. thank you thank you mother bless you it uh yeah this one, so we care, mother. Peace and love. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody here says, I feel like 2022 is going to be the turning point to uh, love to mama. Uh, <laughs> love, mother. Hi, mom. Love and blessings and light to the beloved queen mother. I'm reading some of the um, honors, Mother Jones. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We, 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 we're sending love. <laughs> we're sending love. We're sending love. I mean, it's just, there's so many things, though, you know. Um, Dwayne, that I, in this last year of, 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 you know, forced whatever we've been through, it has given us an opportunity to be still a little bit more and do a little bit more research about things. I mean, you've been on this for a while, but for people like myself and some others who have been on the go and doing this and that, you know, I've been a little bit more quiet. I've been a little bit more introspective. I've been finding different people out here that know about things like i said i sent you that thing about the music industry and you know it's the interesting part is that he was in i didn't know how involved you know wayne williams was with the music industry and again it's funny that you mentioned he could have been you know but you don't know who who needed the might wanted to get him out the way so that they could get <laughs> in the space there are so many things that we just don't know that have been going on that now we know and the question how can those of us who, you know, heard about this growing up and, right, and you know, you know, bought the, the, the media hype and, the, you know, the mainstream media lies, how, what can we do 42 years later to, to, to help you all? What you're, right doing, what you're doing, right. Right. When, yeah. they, when they hear your voice and hear what you're saying, they're going to hear it. And somebody's gonna act, up, act right about it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I, I don't. I, I was wondering about things like the Inner Stitch Project and stuff. You know, of course, that's that's Wayne. But the question is, if if he was deemed innocent, then that means we got to find who's guilty. Right. You see, they, they know. They know. Know about my son, but they didn't know some of the other children. They didn't know about him. You no, know, for sure. Mm -hmm. But they and know. Then, they know they might know mother they might know all they may know it all but you know you know they just haven't you know brought it out because they figured that it was a closed case you know it was closed on it and, and the world like me until wayne shared it with me like when last year whenever you, when you first came on the show i had no idea that he had not been charged with your son's murder and the uh, murder of the other children i just assumed that you know the, the trial was held he was you know, convicted based on evidence and DNA and whatever else, didn't know 
that these two guys who may have even been part of the the ring of what was of Tara were actually the only two that he was convicted of and that was probably even you know a setup so i i had no idea and i'm pretty sure i'm not the only one because you know it depends on how they spin it oh he's been convicted of you know in the atlanta child murders if you say in the atlanta child murder case then you assume it's all of them all right it's uh it's called it's called the law of suggestion or the mm -hmm. power of suggestion right and, and um it's it's a method in psychology you know and and people people aren't aware of what's actually happening to them when they're watching this tell I vision, right? Mm -hmm. And the interaction that they're having with media because media is a medium, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they program you television programming through, via a channel, they're channelers mm -hmm. and they're telling you lies visually. And then when you watch the news, North, East, West, and South, how they choose to control the minds of people, right? Mm -hmm. They use media mediums. So a great example is how everybody got duped into this whole thing with Bill Gates, mm -hmm. right? The, the method in which Bill Gates communicates, everybody look this up. It's called cognitive restructuring. So you might ask Bill Gates a question and you might say, well, Bill Gates, uh, we've heard you give a speech about population control. Well, uh, you know, there are many theories out there about population control, but what's most important is that we have to get people vaccinated. Right. So they completely and totally never give you an answer. Mm -hmm. Right. And they avoid oh, the inevitable truth to talk around subjects. It's called cognitive restructuring. These are the things that are happening when you see these people who are presenting whatever it is they're presenting. So when you watch, for instance, the documentaries with the Atlanta child murders, it's the same five law enforcement officials. Mm -hmm. No one has ever heard a statement from the guy who supposedly heard the splash at the bridge. This is the most important person in the whole equation. Because yep. based on what they say, if this person didn't hear a splash, then they don't place Wayne Williams at the quote unquote murder scene or, or mm -hmm. the crime scene that night. Right. Now, There's how never been is, a statement from this man. And how high is the bridge that, that he, and how big was the guy that he could lift up a man, a dead man? <laughs> 170 some some odd pounds it was a 5 11, some odd pound man and how big of, of a person was wayne williams about five six that too yeah i mean some things you know it's, it's it's it reminds me of now of a, a date that just passed 9 11 how mm -hmm. we just let a whole bunch of ridiculous stuff you know we accepted it and then now in hindsight you're like whoa, 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 whoa. This, this, that doesn't make sense at all that absolutely you know you can't disintegrate a building and find a paper id <laughs> that just happens to be that of the perpetrator and you know that that's who it is you right. know what I mean? and we're like wow they found it instead of like <laughs> that bull crap excuse me mother bull crap. do you know what i mean you know? you know, all the all the people in the world that could have did it, they knew it was Osama bin Laden within thirty minutes of it happening. <laughs> like, yeah, well, I, I think like I the, whole what, the whole they world. What they say? Oh, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! No, but I'm just saying the things that, like I said, that thing. Like, could he pick up a dead body? and heist it over you know at his side over a of course bridge. okay <laughs> so this this is how this is how you know what they say about the bridge is a physical impossibility okay because wayne williams is driving across the bridge nobody sees the car stop on the bridge the person 
who said, is there someone on the bridge? I heard a splash, right? When he says that, somebody else says, yeah, I just moved out of the way of the headlights, right? That's impossible for you to move out of the way of the headlights <laughs> and then a splash happened. If Wayne Williams did discard of a body that night on the bridge, he would have moved out of the way of the headlights, saw the car stop, saw Wayne Williams get a body, take it out of the trunk, the back seat, or wherever the body was, right? Drag it to the to the uh, side of the bridge and throw it over. <laughs> that would have been minutes. Now, mind you, this is on the Jackson Parkway Bridge in Atlanta, Georgia. It's right off of 285, which is one of the busiest I'm interstates in I'm Atlanta. I'm driven it. It's crazy. <laughs> you know? know it's crazy. So there are cars coming and going even at 3 in the morning. There are people yep. driving on this bridge. So you're saying that you just moved out of the way of the headlights and there's already a body in the water, that there was a splash. Another thing that they don't tell people is that he was never stopped on the bridge. He was stopped like three miles up the road on 285. Another thing they don't tell people is that they actually had helicopters out that night and they had frogmen patrol the Chattahoochee River. The body wouldn't have traveled that far if he had thrown the body. They would have been able to find it. Right. So they held him on the side of the road for almost three hours. So this supposedly happened between two and three in the morning. He didn't get home to almost six o'clock in the morning because they had him on the side of the road asking him questions. You know, so they do these TV shows. They do a TV show like Mind Hunter. And as soon as he's on the bridge, there's 30 FBI agents and cops and everything out there. And people actually believe that crap. Yeah. I mean, why were they out there? The question is, what, what were they th were they sure that it was going to be? Had other bodies been found there? I mean, were they sure that something was going to happen that night? Or were they following him? It was, it was the up? last night of the stakeouts. Oh, the last night. They had it was the last night. night of the stakeouts. And another thing is that the person who heard the splash wasn't even a police officer. You know why that's important? Why that? Because if he was a police officer, he would have had to write a police report. Exactly. Aha. Uh -huh. So he was a police recruit that never became a police officer. How was he a police recruit? He was the one who heard the splash that solved the most important case in the history of the city of Atlanta, and he don't even make the force? Great. Set up. He should have got promoted to sergeant just for the that. Head. The same <laughs> day, right? He should have been on the fast track in the police force. Hello? Right? Another thing is that there was only one federal agent out there and he mysteriously died of a helicopter crash. Hmm. The last thing I'll say, um, Dr. G, is for people to know, this case is so messed up that it's one of the cases that was covered in the Department of Justice inquiry into the corruption of the FBI crime labs. Wow. And in the Department of Justice's findings, they found that multiple cases, including I think six or eight death penalty cases, the FBI either lied or gave favorable testimony on the witness stands as expert witnesses that would sway the jury for a conviction in the cases. Wow. 
And their so own, like, one of their own blew the whistle on them as far as the corruption at the FBI crime lab. So what I happens mean, in those cases where these cases were people were then eventually exonerated or was it too late? Because I know sometimes people have been executed and then right. they admit right. that. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so some of the people have been executed. Um, some of these cases that you're seeing reversed, see, they don't just let them all out. <laughs> you know, they don't just say, oh, the FBI lied on your case, you could go. They still got to go through processes and their lawyer got to file this and they got to get a retrial and so on and so forth. But there have been people that have been being let go all over the country. And some of these people were uh, uh, people that were found guilty in some of these cases that the FBI uh, gave the uh, faulty testimony on. Wow. But this case... So that now that apparently you all have been able to overcome the 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 the, 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 what, the gag orders or whatever they were trying to cease and desist and cease and desist cease and desist so, who so can you I say served, where they came from? I was served with a cease and desist, uh, and actually um, the people who came and infiltrated the case. I'm, I I got a lawsuit. I got somebody putting everything together for me. I'm getting ready to sue. And the people who did this, they are actually being sued by someone else already. This is how this is how bad the situation is. Um, in April, I went to uh, New York and uh, myself and a former colleague of mine uh, interviewed with People's Magazine. I remember that. We, we at least interviewed with a man that was supposed to be from People's Magazine because it's so much, much crazy stuff that doesn't happen now. I don't know who's who and I don't know which one of the folks really was people who was trying to help or not. I just know what they about. So, you know, I know I know where they stand. I know where he stand. But um, we interviewed with People's Magazine for almost three hours. And um, the guy said that he was willing to bet his left testicle that it was going to be on the front cover. <laughs> and these people uh, who came and tried to infiltrate the case and tried to come between all of us sent a cease and desist letter to People's Magazine, and they were claiming to be Wayne Williams' legal defense team. And none of these people are attorneys that are barred in the state of Georgia, and they were never a part of Wayne Williams' legal defense team. Hmm. So even more so, people have to ask themselves, why would somebody go to such great lengths to try to discredit the work that somebody like myself and, and my former colleague and, and other people have done if Wayne Williams is really guilty and there's no validity to any of the things that we're saying? Right, right, right. You know. So did that put a halt to the the release of the interview yes it, yes yeah. and it also severed the relationship the business relationship that i had with the former colleague of mine in which we were talking about uh we were actually speaking with uh producers and we were talking about uh multi-season documentary television shows and things of that nature so the truth was about to start really coming out on a major level on a grand scale and they did everything that they did which was breaking the law and risking now having lawsuits filed against them to try to suppress the truth and they even tried to defame my character slander me and so many other things in the process do you know do you think that that came from high in the in the i think so mm -hmm. i think i think there's definitely some um unseen hands because you have to think the fbi the city of atlanta um they have a vested interest in trying to stop somebody like myself and even on, on a greater scale when you look at mainstream media and everything else see i ain't lee merrick i ain't benjamin crump I ain't just showing up when it's an opportunity. Like I'm really for real about my folks. 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and stopping this cycle, you know, of everything that they've been doing to falsely imprison so many of my brothers and sisters in this, this slavery system that they got set up. And then even more, I'm just an advocate for injustices in any form or fashion, you know. Well, I I applaud you for the work that you, you're doing and have done. I applaud um, the two of you, um, Sister Alice and Brother, and Brother Nicholas, for your, you know, for your, your courage and your and your tenacity to keep going, you know, to you know, to see the truth come to light because again you know you need closure and 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 justice is what bring you know in this case will bring closure so you know i i think that this has been a very very informative um i mean this is to me this is as good as any any documentary because we you know you shared shared information that heretofore i didn't even see it in that documentary and you all know because you all were right there with it and and Dwayne, you you know, you've, you've interviewed, I think you have interviewed Wayne, right? If I'm not mistaken. Well, I mean, I've, I have recorded conversations with myself and Wayne uh, from the very first, um, us first meeting each other because, you know, with all of this stuff, like there was a lot of things that I had to get his accounts of to kind of put myself on the fast track because, you know, and putting something together that that would be uh worthwhile for people to, to view as a filmmaker there was so many different nuances and things that i needed to know especially in a situation like this where they done kept everything out of the news media yeah yeah you know but, but you've done you know like i said this is um just one of the many things um please before we go tell the our audience again um your books the names of your books that are out um uh, i know i have okay. Red pill out to me is it? I have two of yes. them. I have a green one. Right. Red one. <laughs> so. right. I'm actually uh I'm actually in the process of um turning in my fourth book, which is called Joel's Journey, and Joel is uh my baby brother who was killed in a car crash in 2011. It it was his name, and I named my first son after him. So the the book is dedicated to my baby brother and my firstborn son, and it's called Joel's Journey. And it's about a uh, kid who who uh, goes to a museum and he has a uh, past life experience and he realizes that he's uh, the reincarnation of King Tut. Um, that's getting ready to come out. And then my first book was another children's book that was called that's called Ariel's Crown, which is my first daughter's middle name. And it was about our struggle from her going from a uh, melanated private school to a public school in which she was being ridiculed because she had natural hair and her hair was her crown. So it's basically showing the journey on how I empowered my daughter to embrace her image and embrace her natural hair. Uh, that's um, the two children's books. And then I wrote a book called Supreme Science Volume One, Does the Matrix Really Exist? It was released in 2016 and then the follow-up to that is red pill alchemy volume one can we beat the matrix that was released in 2019 and i'm currently working on red pill alchemy volume two and that's going to be can we save the babies and that's going to be a very extensive look into uh the subliminal messaging and, and a lot of the uh cartoons and things of that nature and how uh, the P word has been all around for a very long time and it's been placed right in our face. And um, we were unaware, you know. Right. So um, I'm just breaking down just all of the subliminal messaging and things of that nature. Uh, I'll give you one quick one. Do you remember Foghorn Leghorn? I do. The one who used to say, boy, I say, boy, I say, boy, in the cartoons. Yes. You remember the little character that used to say, I'm a chicken hawk. You're a chicken. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Right? A chicken hawk is a pedophile cold word for an older man that loves anal sex with little boys. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. So they were putting, I'm a chicken hawk. 
And chicken is, I mean, everybody knows about pizza and all that type of stuff. Now, in those pedophile codes, one of the, the, the slang terms for a little boy is a chicken. You know, so I'll be breaking down so many of the different cartoons that we grew up on and how the pedophilia has always been subliminally put in these different means of communication. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say thank you again to all of you all. Um, I don't know whether um, to Alice or Brother Nicholas, if you want any say any last words, please. I want to give you a chance to do that before we say good night and um, have to have you back after we you know get some progress so we can find out an update. But if you if you have anything you want to share before we go, please feel free. I just like to say, free Wayne Williams. That's it. Thank you. That's what it is. Free Wayne Williams. Wayne Williams should have been free a long time ago. And that's coming from the mother of one of the victims. Right. It's coming from the mother of, right. of Clifford Joe. Right. Yeah. And he 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 know she knows that Wayne Williams did not murder her son. Right. And you know, when a mother can say that and say that and stand on that, you know, we should also be able to do that and, right. and realize that we've been had. You know, but we're now in the time of knowing, and we so appreciate you. Right. Appreciate you. You got a whole bunch of um, uh, nieces and nephews now that then adopted you. You know, God, God, you. Or God, God, children. We we be your right. God children, and we love you. <laughs> we love you. And <laughs> love and you. I just like to say before we get off of here, Doctor G. Um, you know, we we share we share a lot of our personal experiences with this. I've received death threats over the years. Um, you know, Nicholas has had his, you know, in the last few years being involved, he's had his own trials and tribulations. Uh, the Jones family has been so much for the last 40 years. We talk about so many different aspects of the case and things that people, you know, don't get to see, you know, and we, we do it. I know your show is on Tuesday, so... The audience who watched Dr. G show, y'all just come check it out on the uh, YouTube channel. You don't have to always catch the live stream. But more importantly, we just need people to help uh, share the message because um, the one thing that they can't stop is they can't stop the people united. That's right. That's right. You know. That's what's that old chant? The people united will never, never be, be defeated. Much, right? but defeated. <laughs> yeah, yes, we, gotta, we have to be <laughs> we have to be united. So right. we, we we do appreciate we appreciate your, your your courage and a lot of folks are saying that. I want you all, you know, to share this video. Share it while you can, please, because you know who knows whether that'll stay up. But please share it, share it, share it. And um I'm gonna have of course Dwayne, you'll be back. I know you will. <laughs> and um all of you uh, much love to you all. And I just want to thank you again for allowing me to host this particular um, show to, to share your story. And hopefully, um, you know, by tomorrow, we'll see that a thousand plus 2000 have actually seen it. Cause a lot of times that's what happens. And um, right. justice will be served. At Kid Unleashed on YouTube. Oh, that's what I want to say. At at the, if you are looking at the link, at the link at the bottom of the, of the description, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, there is a link for your um, the videos, the one that you gave me. Um, yes, the way, there's a, a playlist. So you can look down at the, in the description on YouTube and you should see a playlist that you can click on and you'll be able to see, um, uh, go to his their site with um, at Kid Unleashed. All right. And I wanted to say thank you, Dr. G. Thank you for your platform. Thank you for planting the little mustard seed that would grow that mighty tree to tear down wickedness, okay? So I just wanted thank to thank you and send blessings your way as well for this platform. Thank we you so it. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you, I know um, this like beautiful comments. Um, yeah, you, you watched the documentary on HBO, but this one, you got, you're getting it. 
you're getting the truth. You're getting the truth. Amen. To that. <laughs> and that's right. We're going out with a little bit. We're going to blast my music this time. I think we got the speaker, Roy. Right. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Love you, sis. Love you, mom. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 